University for a Night brings together an extraordinary collection of change makers and provides an opportunity for them to identify common interests, share experiences, and discover new partnership possibilities. We also use these occasions to honor individuals who exemplify the values we hold in our hearts and that we believe are vital in achieving the transformation of our global society. We're gathered this evening in the spirit of partnership, which is a principle and a practice that Synergos tries to embody in all of our relationships with local groups all the way up to national and global groups. We hold a shared vision of improving the lives of people in our own communities and countries and around the world. But tonight, we're here to recognize and honor the work of an extraordinary leader who has done so much toward those goals. His Highness the Aga Khan, leader of the worldwide Shia Ismaili community. The award we are presenting has a long name, the David Rockefeller Bridging Leadership Award. It's named after my father, a friend of His Highness, and a longtime supporter of Synergos. My father couldn't be with us tonight. However, he wrote a letter that I'm going to present you that if you don't mind, I'd like to read to the group. Through the Aga Khan Development Network, you have leveraged the social conscience of Islam in ways that benefit people of all faiths, promoting tolerance, pluralism, and broad-based development. From initiatives on the environment to health, food security, and economic opportunity, your agencies are having a momentous impact on the lives of people in Africa and Asia. Thank you for your leadership and vision. As I have done my work uh, over the past decades, I've concluded that one of the most important forces in development is civil society. If you think about the countries around the world which have had fragile governments but which have still made progress, there are umpteen examples of countries which have made progress because they've had strong civil society. And civil society means mobilizing all the forces that can be mobilized in support of human development. And that is why I am so happy and gratified by the prize that you have given me because you are bringing these forces together in the most remarkable way. Thank you. So now I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to ask His Highness a few questions that I'm sure are questions that all of us are interested in the answers to and from which we'll undoubtedly learn a lot. So I'd like to begin with a question about pluralism and tolerance. In a, in a world that we live in today, uh, those are becoming in some ways increasingly rare, rare uh, features. And I would really love your comments as a leader in that field as to how one can promote pluralism and tolerance and your own experience in that yeah. sphere. We found that through much of Africa, through much of Asia, there was rejection of pluralism. There was competition. There was no common purpose. And it was, I think, anchored in poverty. Mm. It was fighting to fight poverty. It was not fighting to fight for hope, for aspiration, for common purpose it was fighting poverty. I think we were able to turn that around by working on the basis that there is a common human denominator, which is the aspiration for a quality life. And if you can find that notion of a cosmopolitan ethic, and you can bring people together around the definition of cosmopolitan ethic, then I think you have a sound foundation on which to build pluralism. Mm. 
So now I wonder if you would comment a little bit on the relationship between philanthropy and development, which is certainly a principle that I share, and maybe right. some of the lessons learned through the network, and also lessons that some of the people in this room could take advantage of, whether they're business people or philanthropists or NGOs. To me today, the big gap is between enterprise only for profit and social development only for social development. There is a massive gap in that area, which is now being described as impact investment. Mm -hmm. uh, I happen to believe that impact investment is one of the most important concepts that I can recollect in the last 50 years. And the reason is that it harnesses social ethic to economic purpose. And the harnessing of social ethic to economic purpose enables you to do things which you could never do otherwise. Because what you're talking about is a double dividend. You're talking about a reasonable dividend on the investment, and you're talking about a reasonable dividend in social development. Both of those can be measured. And therefore, those who make an investment in the impact domain can know what they're achieving with that impact investment. How many children go to school? How many poor people have access to tertiary care? How many people can improve their habitat? How many people can flee from fear? Fear is one of the most dominant forces in developing societies that I know. So these are all aspects of improving the quality of life of people, which I consider absolutely essential. And it is only achievable, I think, through this combination of ethical purpose in economic development and ethical purpose in social development. Probably some people in this room are very familiar, and others might not be as familiar uh, with uh, the traditions of social conscious, conscience within Islam. And I wonder if you could enlighten us um, both about the thinking and also how you've translated that into practice. What, what Islam says about supporting people in society is perhaps somewhat different from uh, other communities and other faiths. The premise that Islam works on is not just helping, but helping to render the individual capable of governing his or her destiny. You are not just helping them away from poverty. You're giving them the means to propel themselves and their families into their future in ways which they control. Mm. And therefore, when you educate, when you help in healthcare, when you give access to credit, you're not looking at just helping the individual survive. You're trying to reposition the individual and the family in society. That is the basic premise of social support that I believe is the correct interpretation of Islam. And would you say that in doing that, because often the communities that you support are very poor and probably somewhat isolated, that the safety that you were able to create, the sense of safety, was an important piece of the giving up some of the fear, beginning to feel a sense of hope, and then being able to live out of the heart? Absolutely. People coming together around a common purpose <clears throat> are much stronger, for example, in eliminating corruption. Mm -hmm. When an individual faces corruption, that's a problem. When a village community faces corruption, it's a totally different issue. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, corruption in civil society is probably one of the most damaging forces that we're trying to deal with every day. It's not only corruption at the level of government. It's corruption in education. It's corruption in healthcare. It's corruption in financial institutions. It's corruption in rural support in distribution of goods. Yeah. So the lack of ethics in civil society 
is one of the really very, very great issues that we have to deal with. And what we've found is that the community organizations, when they come together, what do they look at? It's very exciting. The whole basis of hope is built around best practice. They reject all the things that have damaged them individually, and they come together and say, we want a new future built around new people whom we choose because we trust them. Mm. Thank you. That's a wonderful note on which to end our discussion and turn to the table conversations. <laughs>